Hi, Dr. Newman here. Uh, welcome to um, this video. I want to, this is a response video, a roundup video to the discussion board for week six on um, why more Old Norse words get adopted into Old English and why more survive than do from uh, the Celtic language, the Britonic language that was spoken in Britain before the Angles and the Saxons, before the German, any Germanic people even arrived. And so, um, there was, seemed to be a little bit of confusion and misconception in the um, discussion board, so this video is going to sort of reiterate some things that were in the lectures already and clarify some things, particularly the relationship of the languages to, these, to each other and um, when the people who spoke them arrived, how many there were, etc. So just to remind you, um, Old English is a Germanic language, Britonic, which was spoken in the British islands before any Germanic speakers came, before any Angles or Saxons or Jutes came, is a Celtic language. It is related to modern day Irish or Welsh, and it is um, one of the descendant families of the Indo European super family, but it is separate from Germanic languages, just as Romance languages, uh, Greek. Um, the Slavic languages and Indo-Iranian languages are all like different daughter subfamilies of Indo-European overall. So um, any Germanic language is going to be more closely related to each other than any Germanic language is related to a Celtic language, just as you're more closely related to your sibling than to your cousin. Does that make sense? Good. So. Um, before the Angles, the Saxons, the Frisians, the Jutes uh, came to Britain, uh, there were um, the Celtic language was spoken here. There was a little bit of Latin spoken or Romance, early Romance spoken by Romans and towns. But the Romans came in such small numbers and they were assimilated to the much larger Celtic speaking population in Britain. Um, and so when the Roman Empire fell and the kind of maintaining unity of uh, the larger Latin West, um, Latin died out, died out except as a religious language. It continued to be used in worship and study and scholarship in the British islands. Um, so when the, um, the, the Angles, the Jutes, the Saxons invaded Britain or came migrated to Britain, um, they mostly found Celtic speaking peoples. Now, the old model, and we talked about this, the old model is that they just displaced them and wiped them out and drove them over up into Scotland and out into Wales and Cornwall and down into Breton, completely displaced the people who spoke Celtic before. Now, uh, new genetic and archaeological evidence suggests that that didn't happen, that they simply blended uh, together um, and merged as a people, so to speak, that there was no massive displacement, but there was a displacement of the language. Um, Celtic stopped being spoken in most of England, in most of this big chunk here of, of, the, of the island of Great Britain, um, whereas Welsh, the Celtic language, the descendant of Britannic, continued to be spoken here, here, and another version up here in Scotland, and some of them migrated down here to Breton, where they continued to speak and continue to speak a Celtic language there. Um, so uh, what we're left with then during the Germanic migrations is this sort of distribution of language families. All of these are Germanic languages spoken through all of this pink area here. Up here is Baltic languages, Slavonic languages. Down here what they call Occitan Roman, all the, the, the languages that um, descended from Latin. Uh, were spoken through all here. As you can see, Celtic was spoken in a very broad range of Western Europe uh, through much of what uh, is France, because um, it was called Gaul, and the word Gaul meant Celt. In, in, um, and over here, this area of Spain was called Galicia, in fact, because which is related, again, to that word Celt or Gaul, because that was the last area that Gaul, um, Celts continued to live in and speak their language. Um, but as, we, as you can see here, there was a blending here, as there, was, as there was a gradual displacement of the languages as people in this group, in this area, switched speaking, they stopped speaking Celtic, they stopped speaking Britonic, and they started speaking Germanic. Um, and then we get another wave of Germanic invaders after the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes. And these are Danes and other Scandinavians who speak Old Norse. And they take over 
through um, he, this this was the all old, uh, England before 793. These were the five or the seven kingdoms of uh, six kingdoms, sorry, the Heptarchy of the old English period, and then the Danes come and they end up conquering all of this, but they don't come in enough numbers to completely displace English speakers. And for some reason, um, through all of this area, they did not give up Old English and start speaking Old Norse. Instead, what happened is you get a whole an Old English that is more heavily affected by Old Norse than English ever was affected by Britannic. And this is the question that we're asking is why? What are the factors that influenced this development? Why don't they speak Danish in York? Why do they speak English? But if you listen to really old York Yorkshiremen, they sound a little Danish sometimes. They sound a little birdie birdie birdie, kind of that, that Scandinavian kind of intonation. Why is that? Well, um, some of you had some good suggestions. Uh, many of you had good suggestions, and many of you were barking up the right tree, so to speak, in terms of thinking about what are the factors in language contact influencing the borrowing of loanwords. And you talked about migration and the numbers of people who are migrating. You talked about the social status of the groups using di the different languages. That's important, too. You talked also about the similarity between different languages and how easy it would be for people to interact with each other and borrow words from each other. So these are all important factors and I'm just going to go through them a little bit systematically. First of all, um, there's a tendency for the social status of groups using different languages for the person who speaks a lower prestige language to learn the higher prestige language, the, the language of the people in power. When I lived in Quebec, and I went to the Department of Motor Vehicle Bureau, the, the, you know, the DMV there, to get my license renewed. I was in a French-speaking province, and the person behind that counter, who was a, French, it was a native French speaker, they were damn well not going to talk to me in English, um, for, you know, for, for all kinds of reasons. But, so I had to learn to speak enough French to get by, because I was a minority in that country as an English speaker. Um, in, 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 in the nation of Quebec, in the province of Quebec, and I had to learn to speak their language. That was the higher prestige language there. Um, in the same way, when you go to um, a, a restaurant that's, uh, you know, then there's non-native English speakers there, they're going to come up to you and they're going to talk to you in your language. Um, in the 19th century, when uh, the English were ruling India, a lot more Indian people learned English than English people learned uh, Gujarat or Hindi or uh, any of the other uh, languages that are spoken um, in that. So it, it tends to be that the that the the lower ranked people or the conquered people will adopt the language of the higher ranked people, and this explains why the Celts, um, uh, living under the um, the rule of the Angles and Saxons who invaded um, or or migrated or how, however you want to put it, adopted English. Uh, so why didn't the English then adopt Old Norse? Well, that can involve relative numbers and the relative prestige and coherence of the language that was already there. Um, the, the Danes came over, and the Danes came over in pre, in, perhaps in greater numbers, as, as Van Gelderen argued, than, uh, their, than the, the Angles and Saxons who had originated, who, who had migrated originally centuries before, but the overall population was much greater too. Romano-Britain was decimated by, um, by war and by plagues and by depopulation. All of Europe depopulated during the, um, had a big population dip during the late Roman Empire for a number of reasons. And so just because there was more in absolute numbers, they, they were encountering a more developed and more populated island already. Um, and and uh, the English speakers were already thought already thought of England as the prestige language of the area of the area whereas the Celts for a long time had lived under Roman subjugation and were used to perhaps and speculating a little bit here but were perhaps used to Britannic not being the prestige language but being the um, subordinate language to Roman it also happens to be the case that not many not many examples of old Britannic are written down because the old Druidic religion sort of forbade writing, you want to reveal the secrets of writing, um, 
they had they had certain kinds of scripts, but they were written on trees and they were and they were written in, in they weren't written in any way that preserved it very well. Um, so I'm I'm kind of going into the weeds here, but basically the 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 Danish invaders were high status too when they came up and set themselves up as warlords, and uh, but they um, kind of assimilated into the lower local power structure in a lot of ways rather than completely replacing it. And that is important as well. Um, there also another factor that's kind of crucial here is the similarities and differences between the different languages. And we're going to get into that in a second. But one thing I want to point out um, is that there are different kinds of borrowing. And, I, and here in this um, discussion board, I asked you to talk about borrowing of lexis, that is borrowing of vocabulary. And, the, and McWhorter argues in the Magnificent Bastard Tongue that while English does not borrow much vocabulary from Britannic, from the old Celtic language that was spoken there, it does borrow syntactic features, uh, features of grammar, of word order. Um, and this is because there was this big population of Celtic speakers who were adopting to their um, new overlords by learning their language, but they were continuing to learn it, to speak it in a way that was heavily influenced by their native language and that there were so many of them that that ended up having a kind of long-term effect on the grammar of English, which is why English has so many distinctive features compared to other Germanic languages, which McWhorter mentions in the chapter. Um, I just wanted to sort of give you a sense of how Old English, Britannic, and Old Norse look like in order to make this a little more concrete for you. So let's consider the sentence, the man rides the horse to town. Here's the an Old English rendition of that, and it's probably not perfect. I just kind of came up with it on the fly. Seman on ridath vam horsan totun. Well, that's I kind of, you know, that's English, right? It's Old English. You can recognize words, ride, horse, town, tun. Um, and sa is the ancestor to the, right? So when a, Nor when a Dane arrived in England in 800 and heard this, um, they might have been able to k catch a bit of it, or maybe parts of it. Here's the Old Norse version. Samather, rither, vena, hester, till, borg. Now, so there are a little bit different. There are a few differences, obviously. But obviously, these are related languages. The rither and ridoth has a similar sound. And borg is a Germanic word for town that, that appears as borg in um, Old English is really a fortress, but uh, it's, it's a similar kind of thing. Um, and these are obviously related to each other. Now, like I said, we don't have many examples of Britonic written down, but Welsh, um, the modern Celtic language spoken in Britain, is the descendant of Britonic and will be much closer to Britonic than it will be to English. So I'm going to give you a modern, the, the modern Welsh translate. Now, I don't know Welsh. I typed in the man rides the horse to town into Google Translate, and it gave me this. Um, and I'll do my, I'll render the, trans, the, the pronunciation as best as I can, which will be terrible, but it's something like Maer din in Mahogai Chefilir Blef, or something like that. Maer din in Mahogai Chefilir Blef. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that right. Obviously, one of these things is not like the others, right? Um, Welsh is a Celtic language. It has distinct and significant differences from these two Germanic languages. So it would be much easier for Old English and Old Norse speakers to kind of um, try to talk to each other and, and make sense of each other and find similar words um, so that you get those doublets like shirt and skirt and stuff like that. Whereas Britonic would have been just a whole other thing. And, and it would have been much less effort for a old Norse speaker to learn Old English than it would have been for an Old English speaker to learn Britonic. And so if there's a whole bunch of Old English speakers there already and a Dane is there and he's ruling it, and he's trying to collect taxes and deal with the local church hierarchy, who all speak English, right? Then um, he's going to gradually uh, speak English. And in the meantime, they'll, um, the people who work for him and with him will adopt words from the Norseman's vocabulary. So um, this is kind of the uh, big thing. The, the things that are the real takeaway concepts that I want you to get from this is the idea of 
per the per relative prestige of languages, how people identify with the language they speak, why they would change the language they speak. And this is important to the work we're doing this week in terms of the development of Middle English and the status of French and the um, slow sort of assimilation of French into English. This has been a longer video than I intended it to be, but I hope that it has um, clarified some of these concepts and I hope that I've sort of given you some concepts that will continue to be useful to you for the uh, rest of the semester. So thank you for listening and I appreciate the work that you're doing, the effort that you're putting in. I know this is a challenging class, but I really enjoy what I'm reading from you so far and I continue to work with you now and through the rest of the semester. Have a great day.